that it can act in the spirit of compromise and in the national interest. This bill represents a fair compromise which will meet our country's needs, and I urge all of my colleagues to support it. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Mississippi. Madam President, as ranking member of the Committee on Appropriations, I regret that the Senate must consider in mid-April an appropriations bill for a fiscal year that is already half over. It disturbs me that we have subjected the federal government to eight short-term continuing resolutions over the past six months. Such measures are inefficient, add hidden costs to federal contracts and procurements, and make it difficult for state and local governments to plan effectively. Such measures also have a detrimental impact on the morale of the federal workforce, including our men and women in uniform, who last week, even while engaged in hostilities overseas, were left wondering about their next paycheck. However, this delay has made possible significant spending reductions. The bill cuts $38 billion from the spending levels in place at the beginning of this Congress. It also cuts $78 billion from the President's fiscal year 2011 budget request. These reductions in spending will compound over time and, if sustained, will result in a significant reduction in our national debt. These reductions don't come without consequences, however. The bill cuts programs that are important both nationally and in my state of Mississippi. This bill contains rescissions of funds that I once fought hard to appropriate, but which have not been spent for a variety of reasons. In many cases, we don't yet know the precise impacts of the various cuts because so much discretion is left to the implementing agencies. We all recognize, however, that sacrifices must be made in order to achieve the greater good of fiscal solvency. We also recognize that the bill is only one step toward addressing our nation's debt problem. Though discretionary spending will be an important component of any solution to that problem, we will fail to solve it if we focus on discretionary spending alone. Hopefully, the agreement reached on this bill will lay a foundation for the much more difficult decisions on entitlements and taxes that lie ahead. We also realize that some will think the bill cuts far too little, and some who think I suspect that individually each of us could write spending bills at much lower levels than are contained in this legislation. We could fund those things we deem to be priorities and significantly cut back or eliminate the rest. But this legislation instead represents the priorities of the people of the entire nation as expressed and negotiated by their duly elected representatives, senators, and the president. On balance, the process has worked well, but without a budget resolution or any agreement on an appropriate top-line discretionary spending level, there was little agreement on the level of funding in appropriations bills. As a result, we are once again presented with a single trillion-dollar package that no senator has had an opportunity to amend. The bill gives enormous flexibility to the executive branch because it does not contain the detailed directives typically found in appropriations bills and the reports. And of course, Madam President, it is six months late. I hope that in the coming months, Congress and the President will reach consensus on a budget plan that will address each of the major drivers of our current 
fiscal imbalance, including discretionary spending. If we need to find a way to bring fiscal year 2012 appropriations bills to the floor, we should do so individually and get them to conference with the other body. I believe that such a process would provide needed constraints on spending levels while allowing all members to influence the content of the individual bills. Madam President, I will vote for this bill and I urge the Senate to approve it. The Senator from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, um, I would ask uh, unanimous consent to speak for up to 15 minutes. Without objection, so ordered. I thank the Chair, um, Madam President. Um, Madam President, moments ago I sent to the desk a resolution on uh, my behalf as well as that of Senator Collins, Senator Blunt, Senator Lee, Senator Roberts, and Senator Inhofe relating to uh, the military operations in Libya. And I'd like to speak just for a few moments about that and about my concerns. Uh, like all of our colleagues, I respect our troops and honor them. And of course, their sense of duty, which obligates them to do whatever the commander in chief has directed them to do. And of course, I respect the, the role of our president as commander in chief. But I've grown increasingly concerned that the role of Congress in consultation and in communication with the White House on matters of such grave import to our country and our men and women in uniform is intervening in a foreign country, that the powers of Congress have seemingly been ignored or certainly eroded. We know this is not new. Um, since World War II, uh, to my recollection, the United States Congress has never exercised its authority under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution to declare war. Instead, we've had something other than a war declared by Congress, but most often with communication and consultation and even authorization uh, by the Congress. I believe that it's imperative, particularly in light of the um, subsequent events, subsequent to our intervention in Libya, uh, that the President should submit a plan to Congress on Libya. I believe the President should also come to Congress and ask for a congressional authorization for our continued participation, even in a NATO mission of which the uh, United States necessarily bears a disproportionate uh, responsibility. Like many Americans, I admire the Libyans who protested against Muammar Gaddafi beginning on February the 15th of this year. And these dates, I believe, Madam President, are important. February the 15th. They showed they wanted the same things as people in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Bahrain, in Syria, Iran, and so many other nations in the Middle East. And that is a chance to live in freedom and to determine, have a voice in determining their own future. But like many Americans, I was also concerned that the people of Libya got so much, so little encouragement uh, from the president. True, President Obama said on March the 3rd that Gaddafi had lost legitimacy and he must step down from power and leave immediately. That was on March the 3rd. He said it was the policy of the United States government that regime change was our explicit goal in Libya. Regime change. But he obviously had no plan to accomplish that goal or to further assist the Libyan people in accomplishing it for themselves, other than handing the responsibility off to NATO. Now, this is not like handing it off to some third party that is alien to us or not, uh, not uh, part of us. We are a um, significant part of the NATO operations. For example, in Afghanistan, basically for every one uh, coalition troops from NATO countries, there are two American troops, uh, and we bear the uh, proportionate financial responsibilities as well. The President watched as Gaddafi forces regain the momentum against those that had taken up arms against the regime. France, France became the first nation to recognize the Libyan Trans Transitional National Council 
as a legitimate government of Libya on March the 10th. And then the Arab League asked that a no-fly zone be imposed over Libya on March the 12th. Finally, on March the 17th, this was almost a month after the first protests against Gaddafi in, in Libya, the United States Security Council approved a no-fly zone over Libya, as well as necessary measures to protect civilians in that country. Madam President, the UN Security Council resolution takes a lot of time to negotiate. There's obviously the need for a lot of consultation between the nations making up the UN Security Council. That's why I'm only left to wonder uh, that why it was during this period of time that the President had so little, uh, made so little effort to consult with Congress in a substantive way. I admit he uh, appeared to act like he checked the box uh, once or twice. He sent us a letter on March the 21st, two days after Operation Odyssey Dawn began, letting us know what we could have learned from reading the newspaper and watching on cable television that he had ordered strikes on Libya. But the level of consultation with Congress about Libya was nothing like what we've had in recent years leading up to Iraq and Afghanistan, where Congress issued an explicit authorization for use of military force at the request of the President of the United States. This is not just a constitutional powers matter. This is also, I think, a matter of communicating with the American people about the reasons for our intervention in Libya and expressing to the American people what the plan is so the American people can do what they naturally want to do, and that is provide support for our men and women in uniform, particularly when they are in harm's way. The President waited until nine days after our planes and missiles were in the air to make his case to the American people in a speech at the National Defense University. And during that speech, that the President began to draw a very confusing distinction between our political and military objectives in Libya, saying there's no question that Libya and the world would be better off with Gaddafi out of power. I, along with many other world leaders, have em embraced that goal and will actively pursue it through non-military means. Or, as he put it in an interview the next day, he said, our primary military goal is to protect civilian populations and to set up a no-fly zone. Our primary strategic goal, he said, is for Gaddafi to step down so that the Libyan people may have an opportunity to live a decent life. Now, Madam President, I bet I'm not the only person in the country who, who is confused by this dichotomy between our military goals and our strategic goals. I think they should be the same. The American people, we know, still have many questions about what we are doing in Libya and why. As a matter of fact, I met with some uh, National Guardsmen who were from Texas who were visiting the Capitol just today who asked me a question on this very subject because they are, are confused. If our men and women in uniform are confused and the American people uh, don't understand what it is, it means there hasn't been a good case made explaining the need for military intervention and the ongoing operations. But don't take my word for it. According to a Pew Research poll on April the 3rd, only 30 percent of Americans believe that the U.S. or our allies had a clear goal in Libya, 30 percent. Our troops deserve more clarity. The President told our troops that their involvement in Libya would, ask, would last a matter of days, not weeks. These men and women, as we all acknowledge, are the finest fighting force in the world. They can accomplish any mission given to them, and they can, but they can also tell the difference between days and weeks. Our troops can tell that they're still responsible for about 25 percent of the NATO uh, support missions in Libya. They hear the voices calling for NATO to expand its operations, and then they know that any expansion of NATO's mission in scope or duration puts more of them in harm's way. They simply deserve more clarity, as do the American people. So I think the Congress, on behalf of the American people, consistent with our constitutional responsibilities and our shared power in matters as serious as this, deserve a plan from the President of the United States so he can present it to us 
and we can have what we sorely need, which is a genuine debate about our role and the future, uh, the way forward in Libya. So what should that plan look like? I'll just make a few suggestions. I believe that a credible plan should contain a detailed description of a United States military policy, of a United States policy objective in Libya, both during and after Gaddafi's rule. It, sh it should include a detailed plan to achieve those objectives. And particularly in these times when we are uh, struggling with uh, enormous debt and deficits, it should include a detailed estimate of the cost, uh, approximate cost of U.S. military operations in Libya and any other actions required to implement the plan. Congress, of course, has a responsibility for the purse strings and would be asked to appropriate the money, so I think it's entirely appropriate the President ought to present to us a plan that we can debate and vote on in the form of a resolution. I think a credible plan should also include a detailed description of the limitations that the President has placed on the nature, duration, and scope of U.S. military operations in Libya, the limitations he referred to in his letter of March the 21st to Congress. A plan from the President would, of course, be a catalyst for a long overdue debate right here in the halls of what uh, we call occasionally the world's greatest deliberative body. But we can't deliberate without debate and with an honest appraisal of where we are and where we're going. In fact, it's clear just by referring back to the debates we had on Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the amount of time devoted in this body to Libya uh, is dwarfed. Uh, by the uh, fulsome debates that we had over a period of years relative to Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, what questions should a Senate debate over Libya hope to address? Well, I, think of, I can think of a few. Was the Secretary of Defense correct when he said that Libya is not a vital interest of the United States? Is the situation on the ground in Libya, as reported by the news, basically now a stalemate? Remember that the initial U.S. commander of coalition operations in Libya, General Ham, testified before the Armed Services Committee just last week. He agreed with that assessment, that it was essentially now a stalemate. And I think this is, to me, the most, the simplest, the most direct question. If the president's goal was to stop Gaddafi from killing Libyans, civilians rebelling against him and protesting against his tyrannical rule, how in the world do we stop the killing without stopping the killer? And that would be Muammar Gaddafi. How can we stop the killing of civilians until it is our objective to remove him by any means necessary? I think it's also appropriate to, to uh, inquire as to whether the uh, pottery barn rule applies in Libya. Uh, Colin Powell once observed, he said, once you break it, you own it, the so-called pottery barn rule. Has the administration's focus in Libya distracted it from our ongoing efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq? We've committed huge amounts of blood and treasure to success in both of those countries, and I think Congress needs to know, and we need to have a fulsome debate about whether this mission in Libya has distracted from those other two vital missions. We also need to talk about whether NATO's performance in Libya has jeopardized its effectiveness and reputation. Is there a risk that the alliance is already splitting because of caveats or restrictions that some of the coalition members are making on their participation in the intervention in, in Libya? And finally, I think we need to know, because certainly everything that happens uh, is precedent for some future action, whether there really is something that you might call an Obama doctrine. Uh, is it that the U.S. will use military force when requested by our allies uh, like France or perhaps organizations like the Arab Leagues or the United Nations, but not otherwise? Is it something like the United States will protect civilians when they capture the world's media attention but ignore their suffering otherwise? Is it something that explains why, for example, we're engaged in Libya but not engaged in Syria? Remember that Syria is a nation that is slaughtering its own civilians a humanitarian crisis, I would submit. It is a known state sponsor of terrorism, so designated by the United States uh, Department of State, 
and it is a well-known and notorious conduit for arms from Iran to the Lebanese Hezbollah. Whatever the Obama doctrine is, why doesn't it apply to Syria? We need to ask those questions, and I think we need and deserve, and the American people even more so, deserve answers. I believe the resolution of our debate in the United States Senate should be a congressional authorization for the President's plan, whatever it is, in Libya. But we ought to have a conversation. We ought to communicate. We ought to have a consultation, not treat Congress like a potted plant when it comes to intervening in a foreign nation in a military fashion. I believe the President should ask Congress for an authorization, and I believe we should vote on one. Now, I certainly don't believe that what we've done so far, which is a non-debated, really, um, resolution that was passed without really much notice or debate, is sufficient. Uh, and frankly, I don't really understand why some of my colleagues are so willing to acquiesce to the President filling uh, this entire void and, and uh, conceding to the executive branch all authority in dealing with the matter of this gravity and seriousness. I believe that a robust debate about Libya would be good for the United States Senate. It would be good for the House of Representatives. I think it would be good for the American people, and I think it would be good for the President. I mean, if the President takes action knowing that the American people and the United States Congress are behind that plan, that's good for America, and that's what we need. I'm afraid, though, that the President is taking the support of the American people for granted. The American people instinctively want to support our Commander-in-Chief, but history shows that our military operations are successful mainly when the United States people, when the people of the United States are behind them. And when they're not, when they become disengaged or disillusioned, success becomes much more difficult, not just in Libya, but for future missions as well. And I hope the President will act in such a way that shows respect for Congress as a co-equal branch of government. And the American people who expect that their representatives will debate questions of this gravity in open and ask the questions they themselves would ask uh, before their sons and daughters were put in danger. Madam President, I hope the American people will have the benefit of a vigorous debate on Libya in the United States Senate. And so it is with that objective in mind that uh, my colleagues and I have submitted the resolution. I know there are other resolutions. I believe the senator from Connecticut and the senator from Massachusetts, the senator from Arizona have another one. I'm advised that uh, uh, Senator Ensign from um, Arizona, Senator Hutchison from Texas have another one. I think we need to consider all of those views and have a debate and vote on a resolution. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. The senator from Connecticut is recognized. I, I thank the chair. Madam President, uh, it's coincidental, but my remarks uh, follow in a logical path from those of my friend and colleague from Texas, uh, particularly with regard to the questions, thoughtful questions he raised about Syria, because I, I've come to the floor to speak about the historic and extraordinary events that are taking place in Syria, where for the past three weeks, the Syrian people have been peacefully and courageously taking to the streets of their cities. And I want to talk particularly about what may happen uh, there in Syria in the next 24 hours. Uh, what's happening, of course, in Syria is part of a broader story that's unfolding across the Middle East, a democratic awakening in which millions of ordinary people are rising up against corrupt autocratic regimes that have ruled the region and suppressed uh, these people for decades. But the strategic stakes in Syria are among the highest anywhere in the region. In fact, I'd say what happens in Syria in the coming days will have far-reaching consequences for the future of the Middle East and for our national security here in the United States. The uprising in Syria began like those in Tunisia and Egypt before it spontaneously and unexpectedly uh, it rose from the people, not from outside. It began in the city of Dara in southern uh, Syria, near the Jordanian border, after the Assad regime arrested a group of school children there. When the citizens of Dara began peacefully assembling to protest this absurd act of repression, 
the police responded by firing live ammunition into the crowd. Rather than being intimidated by this violence, however, the protest movement persisted and spread. Although the Assad regime is trying desperately to prevent accurate information about what's happening inside Syria from reaching the rest of the world, it is clear that people, people in many cities around the country are now in open revolt against the Assad regime. From Latakia to Aleppo and from the Kurdish northeast to the villages along the Mediterranean coastline, more and more Syrians from diverse backgrounds are rising up and demanding their freedom. And what exactly are they asking for? It's the same basic demands we hear throughout the region, and they're very familiar, should be, to the American people, because they're, they're the very demands that energized and motivated our rebellion, the American Revolution, and the founding documents of our country. The people of Syria want greater political freedom, and they want economic opportunity. They want into the modern world. They want to be treated with respect by their government, and they want an end to the culture of corruption and impunity that surrounds the Assad regime. And how has Bashar al-Assad reacted to these legitimate grievances? The answer is, he has responded not by offering reform, but by unleashing what President Obama has rightly characterized as abhorrent violence and repression against the Syrian people. He's responded with thugs and militias who have attacked peaceful protesters. He's responded by spouting conspiracy theories rather than loosening his autocratic grip. And as we know now, he has responded by calling on his allies, his patrons in Tehran to help him crush the demonstrations by the Syrian people. Just as the regime, the fanatical, extremist, expansionist regime in Tehran stamped out the protests that took place in Iran after the June 2009 election. Madam President, it's now clear what path Bashar al-Assad is on. Rather than pursuing reform, he is taking a page from the Qaddafi model. He is betting that he can beat his people into submission through force and that the world will let him get away with slaughter. Let's be very clear what it means if Bashar succeeds. It will send a, a most perverse but unmistakable message that leaders like Mubarak and Ben Ali in Egypt and Tunisia respectively, who were allied with the United States, get overthrown. But leaders like Assad, who were allied with Iran, survive. Is that really a message we want to send? Now, what about tomorrow? Why do I focus on the next 24 hours? Madam President, tomorrow is likely to be a critical day for the future of Syria as protesters come together after Friday's prayers. There is a significant danger that it will also become a very bloody day if Assad continues on the path of violence and brutality against his own people. This is therefore an urgent moment for American leadership, at least for America's voice to be heard. It is important for President Assad in Damascus to know today, before the protests that are likely to take place throughout Syria tomorrow, that his regime will be held accountable for its actions. And I hope we will be prepared to act quickly together with the world community if Assad fails to heed the will of the Syrian people and tries to, to hang on to power through repression and murder. What can we do? Well, to begin with, we can impose tough and targeted sanctions on the Syrian officials responsible for the human rights ab abuses that are being perpetrated against their own people. We can also work with our allies to summon a special session of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, just as we did in the case of Libya. 
And we can refer Assad's regime to the International Criminal Court just as we did with Gaddafi. We should also embrace the Syrian opposition, the freedom fighters. I hope senior American officials will meet with prominent Syrian dissidents who are here in Washington now. I also urge the administration to speak out clearly in support of the Syrian people who deserve praise for their courage as they risk their lives for freedom and human rights. They must know that the United States, still the beacon of liberty in the world, stands on their side. In the face of attacks by the Syrian regime, Syrian protesters have remained remarkably peaceful, just as the protesters in Tunisia and Egypt before them did. In the face of sectarian provocations by Assad, the people of Syria who are protesting have remained together, unified, giving a message of national unity. Now, I know that some have suggested that we should hesitate before throwing our support to the Syrian opposition, to the Syrian people as they rise up. And this argument goes like this. Bashar al-Assad is the devil we know. We don't know what might replace him if we fail. If, if, excuse me, we don't know what might replace him if he fails. But we know enough of, about Bashar al-Assad to know, and we know enough about the opposition to know that uh, it, it cannot be worse than Assad and will be much better. The arguments that we should wait and see are, in my opinion, moral and strategic nonsense. When you look at the record of Assad, he is Iran's most important Arab ally. In some senses, Iran's only real Arab ally. And the strategic linchpin between Iran and its terrorist proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah, whom he sustains with financial and military support. Assad is responsible for a terrible campaign, long standing, of intimidation and destabilization of Lebanon. In the blood of Lebanese leaders, too many of them, is on his hands, including that of the great Lebanese leader, Rafi Hariri. As Senator Cornyn said, Assad also has the blood of countless American soldiers on his hands, having allowed Syria to be used for years by foreign extremist fighters affiliated with Al-Qaeda and their link to head to Iraq to attack and kill Americans and Iraqis. And finally, let's not forget Syria's illegal nuclear activities. This is a regime that tried to build a secret nuclear reactor. And they did so with help from North Korea. This is a regime that continues to refuse to cooperate with the International Atomic Energy Agency in its investigation of Syria's illegal nuclear activities. The plain fact is that Bashar al-Assad is not a reformer. He is a dictator. He runs a totalitarian regime that has long been one of the worst in the Middle East. This is a regime that has repressed, intimidated, and in fact tortured and slaughtered the Syrian people. It is a regime that is deeply corrupt, and it is a regime that has been a menace to its neighbors and to the cause of peace throughout the region. Madam President, we now have an opportunity, and I'd say a responsibility, to support freedom for the Syrian people as they seek a better future for themselves. It would be a shame if they and we lost this opportunity for the Arab Spring to come to Syria. I hope that together with our allies, we will seize this moment and stand in solidarity with the people in Syria who are fighting for the fundamental values that our own country was built on, freedom and opportunity. I thank the chair and yield the floor. And I would suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
The Senator from Utah is recognized. I ask unanimous consent that privileges for the floor be granted to my intern, Mitchell Rydra. Senator, we're in a quorum call right now. I ask that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that uh, my intern, Mitchell McBride, whose last day is today, be granted floor privileges today. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. I, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Okaka.
Utah. Madam President, the, the senator, senator from Washington is recognized. Madam President, I ask that the quorum call be rescinded. Without objection, so ordered. Madam President, would the chair lay before the Senate H. Res. Con, H. Con Res. 35? The clerk will report. H. Conrad 35, directing the Clerk of the House of Representatives to make a correction in the enrollment of H.R. 1473. Under the previous order, there are two minutes of debate equally divided previous to the vote. Madam President, I yield back all time and ask for the A's and A's. Without objection, is there a sufficient second? There appears to be, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Balkis, Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Ensign, Mr. Ensign, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutcherson, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inoue, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey. Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Ms. Landry, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy. Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee. Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin. Mr. McCain, <coughs> Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. 
พ่อTo me, I, Mr. Roberts, 
I. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Baucus, aye. Mr. Baucus, no. No. Mr. Franken, no. Mr. Wicker, aye. Mr. No Way, no. Mr. Inhoff, aye. Mr. Brown of Ohio, no. Mr. Blunt, aye. 